Well, good morning. good morning. I'm Nancy Blanning, and um, I'm happy to do my own introduction because then the expectations I can, I can set myself. <laughs> I, I read some very good advice. Uh, it was, this came out of a, of a questionnaire that went out to Waldorf kindergarten teachers to talk about how, how did they work in the relationships with other people in healthy ways. And one of the amusing but really quite smart replies was, always promise less than you know you can do. And so then there's an, a delightful surprise, hopefully, along the way. Uh, so I'm, I'm here with you. I was delighted to be invited to come and spend some in-service days with the faculty here and then other community members who have come to talk about the, uh, the, the, the topic of biographical rhythms. Now, first of all, um, so quite a number of you were, were here of, on Friday night and Saturday, and we had a great big topic to, to grapple with and to picture, and that was more of an instructional kind of thing because development of children and healthy neurological development and physical development is my topic, <coughs> and, and I've studied it a great deal and I know a lot about it. It's different here for us today. Now, I, will, I hope I will be sharing things with you that are, are new. For some of you, they may be kind of reviews of things that you've encountered before, and I hope that we can take things another step for each of us individually. But the thing that makes this so different here is that we are all um, in the same boat together because we're all human beings. We're all adults. We've had quite a bit of experience, and um, we've had moments, some that are very conscious, like <laughs> in your face, and other moments that are kind of subtle and a little bit to kind of grab onto to say, what in the world is going on with my life? What is this about? I mean, that's what all the great philosophers, what is life about? Why are we here? And if from the lens of anthroposophy and the insights that have been shared by Rudolf Steiner, there are some really interesting ideas to contemplate and sort of try on for size and see, well, how does that fit with me in my life? Um, because we, you know, um, we don't want to waste our time. And we want to be happy. And we want to feel satisfied. And that we're, you know, we're doing a pretty good job of living this life. And sometimes uh, these are the moments that we don't re need to reflect very much because when things are going, we must be doing something right, correct? And then it's when we hit a major bump or a, a, an unexpected challenge or something that we try and we try and we try and we kind of, I call it, we keep trying to parallel park in the same place and keep hitting the curb. And so then I say, okay, I think I'm going to drive down the road and try another spot and see there if I can, I can start to understand some of what's going on between me and another person, or me and myself, that nobody else sees that's happening, but something is really stirring inside. So what I would like um, uh, us to, to uh, the gesture that, to adopt this morning, which Gwen has so nicely already started us upon, and the reason that I ask if there could be singing, is that we've walked into this, this room out of a lot of different experiences, both in vast ways and then in just how our morning has gone and what we've had to do in order to get here and be here. And that probably for many of us was a little bit jostly. I'm the lucky one because I don't live here and I have left my normal life behind. Mm -hmm. And all I have to do is this. You're, when you live where something like this is happening, you have that humming, behind your head all the time of the responsibilities that we have with our families, work we might be not going to, etc. Um, so you're the ones who have the greater burden of distraction to carry along with you in these three days that we have together. But like in the morning circle time in all of the Waldorf classrooms where children sing together, they speak verses, they may play recorders and so on, that all gives them a common experience that they have shared and helps to harmonize and bring people more into a, a group experience than we, we had before we walk in individually. 
And so for us to feel like we are um, on a little bit of a journey and an exploration with one another here. Now, the one thing to let all of your anxieties be put aside. There is no time during the time that we will spend together that anyone will be expected to bear one's soul or share things. You can speak not one word this entire time, except to yourself, because that, that will happen. You will be having a lot of inward self-conversation. We'll have the last part of each day, we'll have a little bit more open time, last 45 minutes, uh, t for me to tie up loose ends and remember some of the urgent things that I forgot to say earlier on in the day. But then for people to ask questions and um, make observations if you so wish, but that's not an expectation. Okay? So, um, the other reason why I love to do this, and this is, this is the disclaimer, all that I'm going to share with you has just come out of my own living my life and being puzzled and challenged and looking for something that helped me understand it better. And um, that came through actually through the suggestions of a number of people that I had come to know in the Waldorf schools and in my circle of colleagues. And uh, someone said, well, you know, do you know about the biographical rhythms? And I said, what's that? And then was guided to some resources. And so all of I'm sharing with you has really come out of my own study and research. There is a, a very um, deep and professional training in biography work. For people who want to do biographical counseling, I've not done that. I'm not a biographical counselor. I'm a, I'm a person walking the human path like we all are. But I found this to be so helpful to me in untangling threads and kind of gaining a sense of perspective that um, I'm very eager and, and delighted to share it. Um, because I, 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 I think it will, well, there's not been a group who I've shared this with who has not given feedback to say, oh, I'm happy I came. And if you walk out with one tiny little nugget, these are the kinds of things that then can start to build on themselves. And it gives us a new sense of perspective. Uh, I would like to start by reading something from <clears throat> a lecture by Rudolf Steiner. Because there are going to be a lot of assumptions implicit in what, uh, what we're going to investigate with one another. And one thing that's implicit, actually it'll be very explicit, is that we have a physical world and there is a spiritual world. We've come from the spiritual world to come into the physical world because we have a task that we have decided that we want to do here. And then we return to the spiritual world and we kind of digest all of that and, and d sort things out and figuring out what's important, what's unimportant, what's finished, oh dear, what's really unfinished. And then we make a resolve that we're going to work on it again. And so there's this breathing back and forth between the earthly world and the spiritual world. Now, you can, for whatever your own personal orientation is in life, you can take that as literally or as fairy tale like as suits you. You can just hold on to it or just take it as a, a guiding picture. And I, actually, I'm going to share a fairy tale with us. Um, I love to tell stories and I'm not in the classroom anymore, so this is my chance, you poor victims. And uh, we can take these as just pictures and we don't have to do anything more with them than that and say, well, oh, huh, that's interesting or don't get that one. So I, I invite you to take what you, can, what you can carry out of this and the rest of it that you want to just say, well, I'm going to put that up on the shelf. I'm not going to let it disturb my progress right now. I don't know what to do with that. That's the weirdest idea I've heard in 20 years. But just put it on the shelf and then just, just let us move along with one another. So Rudolf Steiner um, he gave a series of lectures. Oh, it has a, it's, its new name. Now that we are non-sexist in our vocabulary, it really messes things up on book titles. Um, the Spiritual Guidance of the Individual and Humanity is the name of these lectures. In which he says that there are experiences that we have 
at that at the time it happens, we have no I it just seems like, huh, just a little sort of thing. Like you might meet someone and have no idea that that person in time will have proved to be very um, influential in our lives. Might have said something or mentioned a book or or that just something, just kind of lit something up that we don't notice at the time, but later on, we do. And usually those things only awaken and reveal themselves in time, because it takes a while to digest experiences and let things settle into ourselves. And he sa- so he says that um, it's only afterwards of an experience like that that our intellect is ripe enough to understand what we did or said at an earlier period or to understand an encounter. Many people do not make such discoveries about themselves because they do not look for them, but it is extremely profitable frequently to hold such communion with one's own soul. For directly a man becomes aware that he has done things in former years which he is only now beginning to understand that formerly his intellect was not ripe enough to understand them, at that moment, something like the following feeling rises in the soul. The man feels himself, herself, protected by a good power which rules in the depths of his own being. He begins to have more and more confidence in the fact that really, in the highest sense of the word, He is not alone in the world, and that everything which he understands and is consciously able to do is, after all, but a small part of what he has really accomplished in the world. Now, when I read through this this morning, I nearly got off the bed and started to dance. I love this so much, and every time I read it, this is one of my top five favorites of the the lectures. Because um, there is so much, I'm going to use a, you know, a harsh word, that um, assaults us in our lives now. That, and, and so many things that are formulaic. That if you do this, you'll have that result. You know, if you, if you um, don't worry, be happy, then you'll have a great life. What's to worry? And that if you have a moment or a, a, a fallow part, time in your life where things just don't seem rosy, when you're depressed, when you're tired, and you say, oh, poo, like maybe you felt getting up this morning because you'd had a really busy weekend. Um, we will have those moments, but it doesn't mean that we're living our lives wrong. And there are, there's a lot out there that will suggest, yeah, if you only, you know, if you only get the right formula and you follow that regularly, well, of course you'll have a perfectly lovely life. And and if you if you don't feel uplifted all the time, and if you always feel cheerful, and you don't have any struggle or or challenge, well, then you're doing it wrong. And we're going to investigate quite differently a picture that. <laughs> If you have no struggle, you're doing it wrong. Um, This whole picture that Rudolf Steiner has been able to share with us lets us know that, that life has purposefulness, it has intention, it has meaning, and it does have, um, how do I say, I'll, I'll say predictable rhythms. I, predictable is a little bit too uh, tight. But, so the word I will substitute for that, it has reliable rhythms. <coughs> reliable rhythms. And even people in the mainstream, there was a book in the mm, 70s, maybe early 80s, I don't know, I have a terrible memory for dates, by a, a woman named, uh, I think, Gail Sheeney, okay, called pa- Passages which, just from a mainstream perspective, watched people's lives and saw that at certain kinds of ages, characteristic ages, people had similar life questions or career challenges or this or that. There's a book in the Anthroposophical and then Anthroposophy, that's that word. It just means, it means the wisdom of the human being and it's the philosophical 
umbrella title that stands over Waldorf education, biodynamic farming and gardening, anthroposophic medicine, and so on. So, but anyway, this book called Phases, written by a Dutch physician, psychologist Bernard Levegood, he, he wrote particularly taking Steiner's picturing of these rhythms and um, put it into mainstream conversation, mainstream vocabulary. So this, this was really written for the mainstream. We've, there are increasing numbers of, of publications and such that will give us, uh, from the mainstream perspective, this picture that, hmm, there are common experiences and common questions that come into people's lives at kind of characteristic ages. And we could say, well, isn't that in, you know, huh, that's funny, what coincidence is there? But from an anthroposophical point of view, it's understood that, no, 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 that is, that is the gift which we were escorted upon in coming into a human biography. Because those are, they give us guideposts, and they help us then kind of um, be carried by themes. Now the theme, oftentimes, you don't know until after you've been there. And it's a little hard now, so I'm, I have a lot of life to look back on. At this point, I'll be 70 next month. So, and I'm actually, I'm in the free zone, biographically. When I turned 63, I said, I'm through, yay! <laughs> and then, then I, a, a, a good friend, also, we're just about three weeks apart, and, and have been kind of comparing, and, and said, well, yeah, but it's kind of like being homeless. Because where's the script? Where's the predictability? So, but a lot of times, you know, we just have to keep living and experiencing and doing and, and all the things that we do in living a life and then only sometimes later and be able to reflect back on it um, can we see what might have been happening. Uh, what I can say is that one of our children, I mean, we have four adult children and one of them, uh, so interestingly, at age 28, they, she and her husband married when they were quite young. They were 22, which in these days is young. I was married at 22, and I was very mature and old at that time. And, but things shift and change. But they hit 28, which is a very interesting biographical age. And they'd been married for seven years. And boy, did things go on the rocks. Really, really, really very, very profoundly difficult. And it was a, quite a question of whether the marriage would survive. Now, thank goodness it did, because we now have the two most beautiful twins that you could be walking on the planet. And, and they're, they're very solidly in their relationship. And they, I think they just celebrated their 15th or 16th anniversary now, just the last week. But when that happened, what I could do is that photocopy <laughs> from one of the biography books and send to my daughter, um, I think you might find this interesting. And it didn't make it any easier for them to find their way through it. But what made it easier was to say, oh, this is common. Actually, this is the way human lives unfold. At about that age, there can be a really big challenge. And so it's not that we're deficient. We're human beings, and we're just living a human life. And then there is a lot more of life ahead of us. And if we get through this rough patch, we'll have new challenges, but we will have surmounted one, and one that's really, really difficult. Okay. All right. So um, what I'd like you to do now, on a piece of paper, I think most of you have notes, note paper, I would like you <coughs> Two, try to not think, not, don't intellectualize this. That's going to be our hardest challenge in these three days, is to just let things kind of be and not try to analyze and intellectualize everything. I'd like on your piece of paper for you to write down hmm, five, seven, I don't know, three, if that's whatever. Whatever comes out of your mind, your memory, and you're writing down in your hands. Um, some 
events or memories that really stick in your mind. They can be uh, like big things. When you got married, when a child was born, uh, when you moved, um, you met someone, you started a new job. It can be something really super simple. Um, you read, yeah, you read something that you've, you've carried with you for a long time. Just anything like that. Just let it popcorn out of your being and write it down. And we'll take, mm, we'll take five minutes for that. So if you have found that um, your memory pot is, seems a little dry this morning, don't worry because there's going to be a, a lot of opportunity. Things will, will start to bubble up that you can't actively recall right now. And so I'm going to pass out to you um, a chart that we're going to be working with the whole time. Let's see, I'm not sure if I've divided it. This chart is an adaptation um, of, a, of a wonderful life chart that was created by a husband and wife named George and Gisela O'Neill. And so among the book biography works that are available, there's this one called The Human Life, which uh, is produced by Mercury Press in Spring Valley, New York. And this, this chart is um, just a phenomenally helpful tool for beginning to look at biography work. The book itself, it's not the, it's not the place to start if you suddenly develop a passionate interest in this topic. Um, because the, the book is a collection of articles that um, the authors wrote and then were organized together uh, after, after they had died, kind of into a collection, but there's not sort of a red thread that runs through the whole thing. It doesn't develop from thought to thought. Each kind of stands alone. And it's, one needs a little bit more of an orientation. Okay. Now, I didn't keep one for myself. That was silly. No, there's no right over here. Thank you. Now, what I'd like you to do with this chart available to you, I would like you to take three to five of the things that you wrote down and as best you can insert them here on this chart at the, the closest you can get to the age that you remember you were when that, when that event or feeling or experience happened. So you see, so birth would be zero, then seven. Along the chart you'll see every seven years there's a new age that goes from birth to age 63. And this is your own very, very personal bi budding biographical picture. All right, let's, um, let's pause with that for a moment um, because I, I'm going to entrust you tonight to fill this out some more and um, don't try to do anything with it, it's just accept, enter these various events on your chart. And we'll just kind of let it percolate there and see, see what comes. Now, we notice that here that all of these moments are cycles of seven years, or they're segments of seven years. Now, in Waldorf education, for each of us who's a teacher and has had the benefit of some teacher training and study, 
we know, boy, have we heard about these seven-year cycles. A lot, I hope. <laughs> I hope. We've heard about them a lot because they are utterly important um, for us to understand as teachers as to the developmental phases and themes that the children are, are participating in in each segment of the education. And many of you were here on, on Friday and Saturday, and so we spent a long time developing the picture of the task of the first seven years for the human being, which is to come into the development and possession of a healthy physical body uh, and the development of a strong and reliable sensory system. Eyes, ears, taste, smell, touch, the obvious ones then, plus a sense of balance and experience of our body and its organization and stability, which are the physical um, foundations for having a sense of emotional stability and sense of security in the world. And so in early childhood, we are just working all the time, and I didn't even tell you that, so for those of you who were not here, it's, my background is early childhood, although I, I've taught high school and middle school as well along the way. Um, and uh, my specialty really is working with children through movement and imagination to help them develop this strong, healthy body and s sensory avenues that would that reliably help the child to enter into the world and receive impulses back from the world that are true. We have to do that without technology because those things are not true. They're a manipulation. So we spend a lot of time talking about that. And then how do we know that seven, why do we say birth to seven? Because at somewhere in the seventh year usually, in the seventh year would be the year between six and turning seven, we see a remarkable change in the physical body of the child. We see they start to grow, they start to lengthen, the limbs get longer in relationship and proportion to the, to the trunk and circumference of the head. They start to lose teeth, um, which actually they're, they're doing sooner and sooner now, but that's not because they're maturing faster. It has more to do with environmental influences that are just accelerating things with a heavy stimulation of the nerve sense system. But the six-year-old molars are, are much more reliable. They come, they come in that year, and they develop an arch in the foot. If you can see them in the summertime, that you notice that they actually have a rib cage, because you can see them when they're in the swimming pool or the pond. Um, all of these various things, and, and they, they start to slenderize, they lose their little kind of pudgy baby fat. And we just say, well, they don't look like a kindergarten child anymore. They look like a child who's ready, a grade school child. And that happens every culture on the, on the planet. A human being at a, in that seventh year, six to seven, will show us that something has, it seems as though has been finished. And now the child is ready to move on to something else. And so then we start to see... Uh, yeah, it's starting at about age 12 now. That's what I'm really noticing it in our school. Something new is, is coming on here. It really is. And that the, in my, my granddaughter's class, now sixth grade, many of them are turning 12, that um, the girls are proportionally getting shorter and the boys finally are getting taller. And that some of the sixth grade boys now are taller than I am, which is not a big deal because I'm shrinking and they're growing. But you see, their whole, their whole physical being is changed. If you're in the classroom of that age, six, seven, eight on, other things change as well. And um, different, different uh, fragrances of uh, humanity in the room. Um, we see hormonal changes, physical development toward maturation in adolescence. And we also see that the way they begin to think changes. It's not just physical changes, although that's the one that's the most obvious marker. But we do see that they begin to think differently. That happens in 12, and it keeps going on to 14, that where, where it kind of really starts to solidify itself. And um, for the first time, 
At age 12, can the child, the human being, really understand cause and effect? They, they, we think that, we, and we act as though children, now, if you do not brush your teeth, you will get cavities, you six-year-old. So, that's a, huh? That's supposed to be a motivation to brush teeth. It's, it's time to brush our teeth. Come on, here we go. We're all doing it. We, they, children cannot really understand cause and effect. Uh, and that's when, in the curriculum, then the observational sciences of chemistry and physics and optics are introduced because suddenly they can observe and then start to say, Why, how does that happen? How does that happen? And then, collectively in the class, they investigate that and they come up with an explanation because they can now see that's not magic. Something is behind that phenomenon and we can think our way into that. And then, if you have an adolescent child or if you, if you have had an adolescent child, the jaw comes out a bit and uh, you say something that you've said for 14, 15 years and everybody has said has just complied with it, if you're fairly lucky. And then, why? Prove, prove it. Prove yourself to me. Prove, me. prove to me that that's true. And we see a real difference in consciousness and approach to the world in saying, okay, I, I've heard the fairy tales. Now I want the real stuff. Now if we've done our job well, all of the fairy tales have had the real stuff in them, which they will come around to see when they're a bit older. One of the f most fun um, times I've had in our school is when there's been enough, uh, an extra week of, of a block in the 12th grade. And the early childhood teachers are invited to come one by one and tell our favorite fairy tale. And then the 12th graders say, well, what was that about? <coughs> And so for the first time, then we can su suggest, well, this image, hmm, that might be this. And then the, every, every one of them will ultimately go, so that was it. <laughs> because it, it resonates with them now. They're old enough and they can reflect back off upon these things. And they've been guided through truthful experiences in their education that they can recognize truth in, Im in image form and see that it's the same thing, but it's, it has been lifted in an artistic way to make it more accessible. And only later then, now that we have the intellect, can we merge all of those things together. How exciting, how utterly exciting. Now the age of 21, there's another one, here we go, another, why 21? So I was really fascinated by this when I was in college, I um, had a, a study abroad year in England. And the 21st birthday party is a big deal. Huge, huge big deal. I turned 21 while I was there, and so I kind of got a party along with two other friends for whom it was a huge deal. Huge. Fancy, very fancy dresses and um, uh, cards and a huge party and all these things. And even at that time, when I was, I was just turning 21 myself and kind of saying, why 21? Why 21? Because I think by that time, even the draftable age in the U.S., you know, well, the draftable age has always been 18. But then finally we came to the point of saying, well, if we tell them to go off and offer yourself to be killed in a war, you probably should be able to vote about the, for the people who decide whether you're going to go off and have the opportunity to be killed in a war. But, um, but we know that 18 is not the same. It's just not the same. There's a quality that comes with 21, and it's not just the U.S. or England. There's something about that age that has been observed that it's different and it's special, and there's something that kind of goes in lots of cultures. In the same way that there are, at age 14, there are religious um, ceremonies of uh, being welcomed into adulthood, as well as in, in um, other, other societies, 
uh, there are initiation rites that they come about at this time. Well, isn't that interesting? You know, nobody in New Guinea did a survey of at what age do other cultures have tra uh, transition passages, rites of passage for their young people. Uh, it's just that there's a commonality of a recognition that something has happened that's completed and ready to take a new step at these various ages. Now, I was really fascinated in, that I discovered a series of lectures called True and False Paths, because I kept saying, wondering, okay, we see it, we observe it, that the seven is true. Where did it come from? Who, who can explain that? And so Rudolf Steiner, in his very profound ways of being able to do research, <coughs> not only on the physical level, but kind of in, in, the, in the intuitive realm, it describes how in a, in a time that was way, 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 way back, way, way back, called ancient Chaldea, ancient Chaldea, that um, for us to imagine that everybody has looked at like the same in a physical body and had this same consciousness that we have over all the millennia is untrue. And that at the time of ancient Chaldea, human, human beings looked different the physical body was less formed, it was less material. Um, to, it was somewhere between uh, being an energy field and a kind of a soup. I don't know, I, it's very hard to imagine what it is. I just kind of see there's a luminous bubble of consciousness. But at that time, their, their wisdom in observing, and okay, I don't know if so much observing is that these wisdoms were gifted to them just through their own kind of um, clairvoyant capacities because we know we are getting more and more further, further and further separated from spiritual realities. But in previous times, people were much closer to those. And everybody just knew things. Well, one of the things that they knew is that um, this whole idea of a year 365 days, which we all know, is approximate. And this year we celebrate a leap year, a, a leap year, where we add an extra day in to make up for that little about quarter of a day every four years that we, that we're off in the calendar. So we plop in a, an extra day every four years to regulate our calendar and keep us as close as we can be in with the actual rhythms of the sun. In ancient Chaldea, they did it differently. They really looked more to the moon and moon rhythms, but they saw that there was a disparity. You couldn't to say 12 moon months. But they still kept those segments, 28 days, but then every seven years they added in a 13th month. And, that, and by that, by having that 13th month every seven years, then that caught everything up and regulated the times. And because also they experienced of themselves that every seven years a new awakening, a new development of consciousness occurred for them. And so we see that. I mean, it's a very, very ancient wisdom that this seven, and we know that seven is a number that has to do with time, we have seven days of the week. We have, now which we're going to talk about a lot in the next days, there are seven planets that we're going to consider. And we'll have to redefine that because it's not the, the planets that I learned about in astronomy. It is and it isn't. But it also includes the moon and the sun as being <coughs> cosmic bodies that have profound influence up, upon us and significance in our lives. So we, we're, we're going to speak about seven planets. We have fairy tales that have seven in it, seven ravens, seven sisters. We could just, we could lot, a lot of these things, this number seven, and that always has to do with time. When we talk about the planets, that has to do with time because the planets move. They change positions. We talk about, um, as we see, as we experience in our seasons here, we know that there, there are differences, and those occur in time. 
So this number seven is strongly connected to time. We know that the number 12 is also very, very significant. But that we have the 12 months of the year, we have the 12 signs of the zodiac. Um, the signs of the zodiac are also related to 12 different parts of the body. Um, the signs of the zodiac are related to, we know this astrologically, to different time sequences. But those time sequences don't move as such, they stay quite stable. And so when we encounter 12, that has more to do with placement in space. Placement in space with 12 and then 7 with time. And so when we're talking about biography, we're not talking about, we're talking about progression through time and human development. So we have that number 7 there. Now, um, what I'm going to do, we have a half an hour before a break. We'll have a break from... 10.30 to 11, we'll come back and we'll see, we'll see how far we get here. And one thing I have to, we have to all appreciate is that we're just going to be able to get a taste of these things and sort of say, huh, I hope, huh, that's kind of interesting. And that will, that will whet our appetites for thinking about it more and for um, considering it considering it. With these seven-year cycles, um, each has a theme. Now, we know this very much in Waldorf education because the theme for the first seven years is to provide for the child the experience that the world is good. They have to know that there is goodness. We all have to know that there is goodness. And if that's well seated for us in our early years, when we come to experience very obviously that there is also not goodness, that there are very bad things, there are very selfish things, there are very frightening things that happen around in the world. Once we have had that foundation of knowing that there is goodness, then that gives us a, a, somewhere to stand on to say, okay, Underlying all things is goodness. I believe that. I can count on that. Now, that becomes increasingly challenging for us now because we see so many things happening that are, in, to my mind, incomprehensible in um, thoughtlessness, in greediness, in violence, in disregard for the other human being, in disregarding the value of human beings in mass, all of those things. And so where does the goodness come? Then the one thing that we, can, that we do have control over is that it's how we interact with one another and we act and we portray and we give the experience of goodness one to another. Because bad things will happen, but how do we redeem it? And that's by the fact that we strive as best we can to continue to love each other and honor each other, and help each other. And so that's the foundation that we're trying to provide for the little child. And we're doing that in our homes with our own children, everywhere. We do it instinctively. We do it instinctively. The second year is the world is beautiful. I mean, the second seven-year cycle, 7 to 14, is that the world is beautiful. That there is beauty in the world. And when you go, so look, look at the back. Look at the back blackboard. Okay, this is mathematics. Okay, when I studied math, you know, it was the black and white worksheets or, or the purple and white worksheets and the old mimeograph things with the pages that stank of the, the mimeograph fluid. And there was nothing artistic about it. There was nothing beautiful about it. And look at that. Isn't that beautiful? There's balance, there's color, there's artistry, there's an aesthetic quality that, that surrounds all of the different things that the children will experience in Waldorf education. And it doesn't mean that we're artists. I am not. I am not. But it means that we are given opportunities to, what, to whatever possibility we have come into life, whether the, we're the most pedestrian artist or whether we actually have some talent or whatever, um, we develop, we experience in seeing 
the efforts of our teachers, and we have we are called upon to be a human being because human beings can create beauty in whatever form it is. We're the only we're the only species, if you will, that can. Um, I, I, I have to digress. So I just have finished doing first grade readiness screenings with a whole bunch of children, and there is a child in our school who's a really interesting, lovely, and very unusual child. And her father is um, really dedicated to educating her about real scientific facts. She's, her birthday is today. She turns six today. And so I, one of the things that I do when we're doing these first grade readies is that to kind of get a sense of the child's memory, I say, six-year-olds or children who are almost six, you always know lots of animal names, different kinds of animals. I collect animal names and I write them on my paper. And then if I hear something unusual, then I can add it to my collection because I collect animal names. So she, you know, so I, I've learned to not, because they've said, okay, Fido, um, Puffy, and I said, names like dog, cat, so we get on the right track. So she's listing regular animal names, and then she says human being. My dad says that human, humans are animals too. And I thought, oh dear, what do I, how do I reply to this one? And then I said, hmm, we're just talking about ones with fur and feathers <laughs> to get us back on the track. So there's truth and there's truth. And hmm, how much do we need to know? How much do children need to know? I have my own prejudicial views. and <laughs> I think they don't need to know that. But, so we want, we want it to not be a stark reality. We want it to be imbued with beauty. And because we're the only ones who can make life beautiful. We are. Artistically, artistically in our interactions with one another, we can create beauty. We're the only ones who can use these hands in an intentional way that's not driven by instinct. It comes out of something that we resolve to do because we have the intention um, to do it and to make beauty. We can also make horror, but that's not the theme. The theme is to emphasize the beauty for the children um, so that we will carry that with us. And these are sort of like, when you're on the, the Sahara Desert and you're parched, you're, you, you've got the, the water skin full of, tr of goodness and you have the water skin full of beauty. And if we've had the preparation for those, then we, when we encounter truth, which can be stark, but not as it's presented in the Waldorf schools, but as the world sort of you know, shines this really un unbelievably stark light of a spotlight on something. So you say, there's no mystery there. There's no mystery. Well, we know there's mystery. And we, we unveil the truth by letting the children find their way into the mysteries and discover the truthfulness without the mystery being destroyed. Okay. We have awakening independence for these first 21 years at about age three. Average, average. The child will, has before we would say me want, um, uh, Sally's, Sally doll. Me do it. Me. Mine. And then suddenly there's a switch. And they say, I. I. And it's, it's almost as though, you know, the child has been, me, mine. We do see that gesture, don't we? Um, beyond the age of three, unfortunately. But the child is more like there. And then suddenly with the I comes, I. And it's like a light goes on. And the, the child becomes different. And it's the first awakening of personhood and independence, but in the most wonderful way. I, I am me. I can, I can initiate in the world. And the first being able to step toward one's true independence and individuality. We see it more, six, seven, uh, because now they're becoming not so much in inwardly turned and in their tiny little social circle, but to come into more of the wider circle and enter into the world 
which is what they need to be ready to do to go on into first grade, to explore that. And that's another step. I mean, that step from the kindergarten door across the threshold of the first grade, it, it's a big step. And we have children who weep. We have parents who weep, especially if it's your first, your first child you're launching. Um, and it's not necessarily easy, but it's the right step to take and to do that because you're going to enter into the world and take your new step toward your own individuality. At, seven, at nine, mm, nine, if you have a child who's reached that age, the, um, the, the nine-year change, the dark moment, when it's, it's a new sense of awakening, but whereas the other ones, you've still felt that you're kind of um, um, surrounded by a cloak of cosmic light. It slips off. It slips off. And we can start to have some feelings of, of isolation and loneliness. Um, it starts sometimes at five, then it goes to sleep quickly. But at nine, we start getting questions about, um, when will I die? Mommy and Daddy, how long will you live? Will you live long enough for, for me to be all grown up? Um, questions about, are you really my parents? Where did I come from? What can I trust? And it's, it's, a, it's an absolutely necessary moment of passage. We've got to go through that because we have, to, we have to be able to take the cloak off and still then, from the inner inside out, to develop our own growing confidence and sense of competence in being an individual human being. When, uh, the, just before our eldest daughter turned nine, I walked into the bedroom one night and her bed was like in a corner, and she was standing in the corner like this and sobbing, sobbing, sobbing. And I said, honey, what's wrong? And she said, I don't know. I just feel so sad. And that was a profound expression of this. She was experiencing it. At that time, we didn't know anything about this stuff. But now, looking back on it, I say, oh, how archetypal. Then the next daughter, the night before her ninth birthday, I'm saying the birthday verse to her. And, and tomorrow I'll be nine years old. And she said, I want every picture of me to be from when I was eight. And she listed a whole bunch of things that she wanted. She wanted to keep the toys from when she was eight. It's like she knew somehow something was going to happen. And she wanted to hold on to being eight. Please. So we'll see awakening of consciousness then. We'll see it again at 12 when there's a new way of causal thinking. We'll see it at 14 when suddenly it's as though, you know, if we've been lucky enough and, and they've been a little bit of a sleepy child and haven't put on the adolescent glasses of criticism <laughs> and seeing us starkly and pointing out to us absolutely every foible and weakness that we have. Uh, and... Uh, Grandma, I didn't know your back was so fat. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Where goes that swimsuit? <laughs> These little things that, huh, well, we, we, we get reflected upon ourselves and have to find our own grip of individuality and security <laughs> as they do. So we see those things happening. And so then 21 comes. And at 21, uh, it's, there's usually, at least culturally, we assume that there's a, a, a new level of maturation that has been achieved. Something has happened. In terms of anthroposophical description of it, it's that the, the ego, and we, there are a lot of parts of ourselves. At, and one of those parts is we call the ego. That word has, is colored by a lot of different ways of looking at things psychologically. So as I understand it in any of the new translations that are being done of Steiner's lectures, instead of saying ego, the I or I being is being it replaced with that. Because it, that's a cleaner 
uh, untrammeled concept that there is there's a part of us we've got a physical body we have our emotions you know we have we have our organic life that makes the physical body do something enlivens us and then we have our our likes our dislikes our soul life our feelings our emotions all of that that's a part of us too but then there's what makes us different from the animals because the animals have those three parts also but we have an individual I being that's the captain of the ship and that's trying to take um, I don't want to say possession t take directorship of all the rest of us so that we can learn to restrain our impulses appropriately so we can learn um, to not grab that chocolate bar out of somebody else's hand that a four-year-old might do because we know that that's impolite. We might want to, <laughs> but we won't. We learn to restrain our impulses, restrain our instincts. We learn to delay gratification. We learn patience. We learn that um, discipline, uh, working hard over something over a long period of time may not be fun, but it really does pay off. And, it, and we can develop longer term goals. So, uh, 21 to 28 is characterized as the age of adventure. It's going out into the world, and our young people in that age group now uh, don't so often settle into a career right away. You know, when my father, my father's age, so you get out of high school, it was very rare if you went to college, uh, you might be, you know, become a plumber. So you become a plumber's apprentice or a carpenter or whatever it is. You would go into a trade or a vocation. Uh, now things are much more fluid, and then also because there are not such predictable occupations that one can easily step into because of our economic interesting life that we have surrounding us. But uh, people, uh, young people will try on a lot of different things, a lot of different things. And to see, well, what might I like? And they might travel. It's the perfect time to do a lot of traveling if one has the resources to do that. And to go off and take a gap year, to go do an internship someplace, uh, to be a woofer and go from biodynamic farm to biodynamic farm so that you can find your way around the world. Um, those different sorts of adventures. Uh, and... Um, Often, increasingly, child childbearing is delayed. And so, whereas families started to need to consolidate themselves at younger ages, now young people often are not starting families until they're in their 30s. Of our four children, no, no grandchildren were born to parents under 30, actually under 32. Um, so, there's, there's this adventuring and tasting the world. What is it like? And it can, feel, it can feel quite nice to not have a lot of responsibilities and have the opportunity to go exploring. 28 to 35. Ah, well, so often people in those times have settled into a job. Maybe it's not your heart's desire of a vocation or a profession. But life speaks, and mom and dad are not going to let you have that bedroom forever, uh, which is an exaggeration, but not always. Um, you have to find out and figure out how to take care of yourselves. Relationships are often consolidating themselves. Commitments are being made. Families often are, are, are starting to, to have a family and so on. And um, interesting thing, so the first child... Uh, is always very exciting and as a new parent you feel like you're the only one that's ever had that experience and it's true because no one has ever had the experience that you're having and no one has ever had the child that you're having so it is absolutely true but sometimes we kind of lose our perspective a little bit and uh, uh, but and and then generally you know there's a, you're, you're literally showered with attention and so on and gifts and such. And, and often um, a lot of people bring you meals. And then the second child comes. And uh, that's kind of ordinary. 
I mean, I can remember when, we, when I was pregnant with our fourth, in these days of zero population growth. Um, oh, another child. Oh, well, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> so life, life starts to get a little less rosy, and it's a little kind of dustier. It can be. It can be, at least in the way that, that the, the society approaches us or responds to us or the, the various expectations. Um, and so it, it can be hmm, uh, a little less exciting. It's usually, it's, I mean, or the excitement comes from sleepless nights and crying babies and, and feeling very tired. And how do, you, how do people do this? How do, how do we have children and we work? And, and my, my, one of our son-in-laws, uh, who's French, every, so their children are now five, and they're the ones who have been married such a long time. And every time that we get to see them, he says the same thing. You know, having children really changes your life as a couple. <laughs> so, yes. And so when we get to 35, hmm, that why is 35 characteristically kind of one of these gray birthdays? If you were to color it, what would it be? It, it could be gray, blue, something like that purple. It's not usually yellow. It's not usually red. It's, it's kind of subdued. And it's not only Rudolf Steiner's observations that the age of about the age of 35, and you notice that that's really quite down here at the bottom of the curve. It's because at about age, at about age 35, those forces that have carried us literally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, um, the, the obvious access to those things that have just flowed to us, very much so in the very young child who really is lifted up onto their feet into uprightness by angel strings, by spiritual forces and gifts that have come from the spiritual world. That's not that the the child does it because the child suddenly says, okay, today I'm going to stand up. It doesn't happen that way. It's quite an unconscious accomplishment. And then on subtle and subtler levels, we are still being guided and gifted by those forces. But at 35, it switches. And what has given, been given to us externally and supported us externally has reached its termination. And now, how are we going to climb up the other side? And that's when the time in life goes from outer to inner. And so the kind of a question of age 35, and we're going to, we're going to flesh this out for sure over the next two days, because that's where I meant to ask, so obviously everyone here is over 21, yes? No? Oh my goodness. Well, uh, this is a, a particularly different experience for you, <laughs> and a good one, and a very good one. Because the, the other part about this is, this is what's the, the good part, it's both the frustrating part, because you'd like to know what's going to happen, right? You'd like a script that you can depend on. Life doesn't have those scripts. But there are always opportunities and there are always invitations in life as to how something can unfold. But we have the freedom, the total freedom of how we're going to enter into those invitations. If we know what the invitations are, that's nice. And so for you, that will be um, the possibility to know what these invitations might be. So when we get there, and that's the thing, none of us are finished, but when we get there, it doesn't mean that we're going to know exactly what to do with, by what the thematic content of that seven-year cycle is going to be. But we have a little forewarning and can say, all right, I know things are going to approach me. However my, it unfolds for me what my age of ad adventures might be, um, I, won't, I can't predict, but I know that... So, 
some of those kinds of things are going to come for me, and that's very exciting. And when we get to 35, and then suddenly, if we suddenly feel, it's not an if so then given, but if we get to that point and we suddenly say, ah, oh, do I have to work, do this job for the rest of my life? We really wanted kids. It's great. But right now, it's not my most favorite thing to do. Am I only halfway through my life? Well, how are we going to do this? I mean, I'm exaggerating, of course, but we will have moments like that. We will. And if we know that when we get to that point, that what we're experiencing is not a personal defect, it's an existential question that every human being who is growing and striving to develop oneself deals with. That's a comfort. That's what I hope will be a comfort. So we get to 35, where it's talking, working over experience. We've been experiencing from 21 to 28, and of course we continue to experience, but our, our <coughs> viewpoint of it and our, we can increasingly, instead of being right in it, in the adventure, then we can step back a little bit and we can reflect upon the adventure and start to sort out what was helpful, what was important, what was not. What was essential that I want to remember out of that? And what can I just kind of say, well, that was fun. And I can leave that behind. And then from 35 to 42, it's called loneliness. And it sure can be. Again, the sparkle, the excitement uh, has dimmed. Appropriately, it probably should. It probably should because we, were, we, were, we are trying to mature ourselves. We head toward 40. Um, uh, things can get quite challenging, and we know that moving from into the 40s, 42 to 49, often called the dangerous 40s, are term for the midlife crisis. It's not really midlife exactly. Midlife is more 35 to 42. But I guess you're just getting ready to see, will I have a really obvious, embarrassing midlife crisis when I'm 40, in my 40s? Or will I try to deal with my existential questions differently? Now, I'm exaggerating again, but I wonder how many red convertibles are sold to men and women who are over the age of 40. I wonder how many divorces occur in the early 40s or particularly around the age of 42. That's when my parents divorced. When I came to biography work, I could understand and forgive so many things that had just wounded me as a human being and as the offspring of my parents. Which I'll, you know, I'll, I'll share some things with you. There's no point in me not sharing some of my personal experiences because I have to be honest with you. That's why I do this. It's because I've made some sense out of really hard moments, um, which I've, I, have, I have had a really fantastic life. I have one of the best lives of anybody I know. But it doesn't mean that there haven't been really hard moments. All of us have them. So... We sort of say in the loneliness, we say, well, how am I going to finish living this life? What, with what will I fill it that, makes it that feels worth doing? How will I continue to grow? I really don't want to sit in, in front of the TV, and that's my life. I go to work, I come home, I'm tired, I eat dinner, I watch TV. That was, you know, that was the 50s. That was what people did. And the 50s are looked at as a really gray time. Really gray in many, many people's lives. So we work on that. So, well, what, do I have enough substance in myself that I can, out of my own initiative, take a step forcefully into the rest of my life? Which is the question of the 35 to 42. And the answer that one comes to then is, well then what, how will I meet the challenges that come in the 40s? when I um, will be challenged with um, 
revisiting and resolving, if I so choose, experiences that I had in my adolescent years. So I'll, I'll just draw this, point this out to you. You see how the chart has these different seven-year segments parallel, I mean, you know, adjacent to, not adjacent, right across from each other, horizontally placed equally to the other. Um, and that is that, so we, we do all of this, and then as we're ascending, we are also reflecting, we're resolving, we're completing. And if there was something here that happened that was not resolved, we will deal with it again here in our 40s, in one way or the other. And we cannot always necessarily anticipate what form it will come. But we can look at it as an, oh no, I, didn't, I, I never want to have to deal with any of those things again. That's a human experience and it's human response. Very, it's, there's nothing wrong with this if we feel that way. I'm just so happy that I never have to live my adolescence again. I can reflect on it, but I don't have to live it. Um, then we come, and when we make it through the 40s, usually, and I remember just before my 50th, my 49th birthday, because your 49th, when you turn 49, you're entering your 50th year. And I was really looking forward to that one. And I remember I was literally reading in one of the books, and I said, oh, I'm almost out of this. Yay! You know, we're all still intact. All of us are still intact. Our family's still intact. And so we make it through that. It, it can be a danger zone, but it can also be a profound opportunity, and that's the thing. Everything that comes towards us that can be challenging, also, if we, depending upon how we embrace it and how we, we approach it, it's an opportunity to clean things up, really, to, to resolve and to strengthen. It's, um, I, it, it, I, I say that with the most enthusiastic conviction. I really, I really celebrate that for all of us. And so we then have opportunities that we're older. We are more mature. Life makes us that way, even if we're trying to do it or we're not. It's, it's a nice thing. Experience really helps us figure out things and rectify our skills and figure out, well, then what, what do, what's important to me in life and how, how do I work with those things? And so we can become more expansive, we can become more generous, we can become more community-oriented, um, all of those things. So we're at break time. I've given you just the tiniest little schematic of this. And then when we come back at 11 o'clock, then we'll flesh it out some more and bring in a few more aspects to it um, that will guide us into the afternoon. Okay, great.